Okay, everyone, hopefully a quick session before lunch. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, back on topic. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, graphics. And this is relevant because many of you, depending on where you are or, or what program you're involved in, will be doing some kind of poster presentation or maybe, maybe you'll be asked to do some kind of write-up after your session. And so it's, it's uh, helpful to be able to make graphs and images that look pretty on a poster. And, and let's be honest, I mean, a lot of what scientific communication is, is being able to convey ideas in a way that is helpful to the, to the reader or the person attending your poster. And so being able to make graphs is, is actually pretty useful in that regard. And so that's kind of the goal of this session. Um, we, we really care, at least I really care about making uh, making this accessible, but then also making it, it so, making software that students usually have on their computers or can get fairly easily. And so hopefully this, uh, this will follow in that vein. Uh, obviously, why would you like to cut? Well, nobody wants to have crappy graphics on their posters. And so, so that's something that, that I think is just a universal. And, and we've all, well, maybe, maybe we all haven't if you haven't been to a poster session. But certainly, I've been to poster sessions, and, and I'm sure most of my, my group and many of our, our grad students have been to poster sessions where you've seen, you know, they, they've presented really nice data, but, you know, maybe their graphs are pixelated, or maybe there's, there's you know, it's blurry and it's not, um, not as clear as it probably could be. And so the goal of this is to give you an uh, ability to make uh, a graph or a graphic that you can use and then be proud of when you go to present it. And so you want sharp looking posters, you want to be able, you don't want that to be a distraction from your main message. And so that's something that, that uh, quality graphics help. Uh, if you ever end up publishing, uh, and, and many of you will, will hopefully go on to graduate programs or, or think about graduate school uh, where you'll be asked to write and publish papers, uh, many journals require uh, resolution and, and have certain quality standards. And so, uh, a very common one is, you know, your images have to be presented in at least 600 pixels per inch. And so how can we do that and how can we make a graphic that's going to scale up to that? Um, and then the other thing is that this can be useful for, for your readers. Like if, if, if somebody looks at a figure in a, in a poster or they maybe have a PDF copy of your, your presentation, you know, it's always nice if you can zoom in and say, oh, look, I want to see what that, that little, little detail is. Maybe you don't think it's important, but part of scientific inquiry and communication is being able to share data and allow others to, to inspect it and, and critique what you're doing. And so that's helpful as well. And so, you know, if you're on a, on a PDF or you're looking at the PDF version of the website or version of this graphic, you should be able to do this. Uh, otherwise, it's a little bit hard for me to do it in presenter view. But here I have two pictures of, of Bully, the uh, Mississippi State mascot. And one of these, I'm going to basically try to zoom in. And right, so I can, I can hit shift and, and basically try to make this as big as I possibly can. And so you can see from, from this perspective, you know, this is where you get to graininess, right? So I've made it big enough. And I can even go over here and, uh, into uh, height and width in my PowerPoint. And let's make this, you know, let's make it 20 inches. Um, you know, it gets really, really grainy. And, and that's kind of what you would want to avoid if you're trying to put something on a poster and make it look cool. Uh, so let's put that back at something reasonable. Uh, how about two? Okay. Now it looks fine when it's, it's not blown up so big. Let's take a look at this version of the image. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to go and I'm going to make it 20 inches high. Notice that there's something different about how this image is rendered. It's, it's just as clear as ever. Right? There's no pixels that are visible at all, and it's something that I could probably blow up you know, even bigger, so let's make it 40. Again, you can see it's, it's you know, obviously too big to move on my, my screen easily, but even at this level of resolution, I'm not seeing any pixelation here. And so the difference between these two image files is basically how they're stored digitally. And so appreciating this is why we're putting it into something like boot camp, where we're talking about lots of computational aspects of, of things. Let's, let's take this back down to a normal size. Hopefully I can move to the next slide now. And so when we think about this, we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail about the theory of how, how, how to store graphics. 
But the big difference between these two images is that one of them is stored pixel by pixel, right? And so this is called rastered imaging. And basically, your, your, your file, your image file, is basically, OK, we're going to talk first about this top left pixel. And I'm going to store the color of that top left pixel. And then I'm going to talk about the, the one that's right next to the top left pixel. And I'll go next to that. And I'll continue talking about each pixel individually, where every pixel is basically storing the color of that pixel. And so if I have a 1024 by 7, 768 image, um, you know, something about a megapixel, if you ever heard of that in your cameras, um, they're basically storing the pixel and then the color of that pixel. And so that's one very easy way to store image file. It's called rastered because that's basically what you're doing. You're rastering a top across the top of the, the, the line, and then you raster the next line, then you raster the next one. Um, this is great for things like photos, where every pixel is probably going to have a different color. It's, it's pretty good for, for complex images, where you might have very uh, complex shapes. The software that you would use to work on this type of a, a rastered image uh, would really best be like Photoshop, if you have a lot of money. Or uh, if you don't have money, uh, or you want to just don't want to spend money on Adobe products, uh, there's a free version of this called the GIMP. And you can download that. We're not going to have time today in the session to go over the GIMP. But uh, after a brief learning curve, it's pretty straightforward how to use. Uh, and so those are the programs that you would do. And this is one way you would make publication quality images. If you're taking a microscope picture, for example, or a picture of some maybe cuvettes that you've made, you might you know, go into Photoshop and adjust things like the dots per inch and scaling so that you can, you can um, you know, meet the, the publication requirement. Generally speaking, if you're working at 600 dots per inch, you're never going to have any problems whatsoever. Uh, the human eye can really only perceive, I think, 150. Uh, so even 300 is, is, is usually plenty if you're putting it on a poster. Uh, but 600 gets you really safe, and it also lets you blow it up a little bit without getting grainy. Um, but anyway, both of those programs are really good. The alternative way to store graphics, though, is rather than trying to store one pixel at a time, let's store the graphic as the shape. Right? And so this is, this is called vector graphics. And this is an image that's basically been stored as vector uh, format, where instead of form, you know, storing the pixels, and this pixel is going to be green, this pixel is going to be blue, this pixel is going to be black, now you're basically saying, OK, my shape consists of a red triangle that's centered on a blue circle that might be you know, off-centered on a, a, a gray rectangle. And so instead of storing, you know, pixel by pixel, you're saying, hey, this is the shape. These are the, the, um, the, the, you know, the mathematical representation of each element that I'm trying to represent. And, you know, that might be filled. It might have a color fill. It might have an outline. Uh, if you're thinking about PowerPoint, Right? When you go into PowerPoint, you make a shape, and you say, oh, here's a red circle. That's a vector type of a representation of an image. It's not telling you, oh, there's pixels here. It's saying, oh, I have a circle that's basically offset on the screen. And so we can do that right here. You know, If I draw this circle, and then I try to zoom in on it using PowerPoint zoom feature, right? it's, it's letting me zoom in because it's stored as a circle and not a whole bunch of pixels. And if I outline that over and over again and make a very complex image, like say this bully here, right? I can store something that effectively has infinite resolution, and then I can blow up as much as I might possibly need to blow up for you know, a poster or even a billboard. Right? And so that's the basic difference between these two. Uh, things that you might use for um, you know, vector images would obviously be graphs, right? You're often storing, you know, lines that have a mathematical representation, as we talked about in yesterday's model fitting uh, type of presentation. Um, you know, those graphs are basically rectangles, so you can represent them as, as mathematical. You know, this is a rectangle with length, you know, four centimeters and height two centimeters. So, so those types of things lend themselves very, very nicely 
uh, to vector types of images. And the plot software that you might use, if you're not just going to use PowerPoint directly, which is probably what most of you will use, uh, but you, know, you can use a program like Illustrator, which has a pretty significant learning curve, but can also do pretty incredible images. Uh, Inkscape is kind of the free version of Illustrator, not nearly so powerful, but, but often you can get by with it. Uh, and so those would be what you would do if you were trying to do vector types of images. You know, alternatively, if you're using a program like Excel, it's already generating a vector image when you make those, those graphs. Uh, and other types of programs like Origin or GraphPad would be generating, you know, they don't generate graphs usually in pixel form, although you can tell them to do that, but they have the ability to generate vector images. And so different types of file formats, this way you can sort of know what's going on. You know, your raster formats are, you know, probably the biggest one that people use today is PNG. Uh, JPEGs are, are often used in cameras or, or still image shots. And then uh, TIFF, which is kind of the, that's kind of the gold standard. So you can always convert a vector format into a raster format just by doing some, some rendering. And most journals that, that at least we publish in uh, accept TIFF graphics at a certain dots per inch resolution. So those would all be raster formats. Vector formats would be something like a PDF, right? I mean, what is a PDF? But it's, it's storing text. Text is just shapes. And when you zoom into a PDF, you can often zoom into extremely high zoom levels and you don't see any, any um, pixelation. So, so PDFs are really just storing the shapes of text um, on the page. Uh, SVG is kind of the open source scalable vector graphics that you can, you know, most browsers I think are starting to be able to use this and read it. Uh, PostScript is kind of the original uh, vector graphic format. And again, if you go to original PostScript printer file, it literally says, draw a line from here to here and color it with this. Um, and then lots of Office tools. Uh, for example, PowerPoint, we already saw. Word documents, if you draw shapes there, they're going to be stored as, as a mathematical representation and can in principle be stored at, at high, very, very high resolutions. Okay, so two very quick things about images, right? Um, if, you, if you have images compression, uh, just be on the lookout for lossless versus lossy. Uh, so JPEG files use what's called a lossy compression, where they can make the file much, much smaller at the expense of image quality. And this works because your eyes and my eyes don't necessarily perceive every single you know, detail in an image that we look at. Right? And so this is, this is high quality, this is medium quality. I'd be willing to bet that most of you looking at this on the screen really can't notice the difference, although this is a substantially smaller, I think it's a 10% smaller file than the original image. On the other hand, if you, if you go to the extreme, you can start seeing uh, image distortion artifacts coming from how JPEG is working. This would be called a lossy compression. Uh, most other compression that you would use for video or, or uh, images would be, would be lossless. And those would be things like zip compression, um, uh, LZF, I think is it, is the name of the other compression technique. But, but if, you, if you use some kind of compression, for example, on Photoshop, it's generally going to use lossless compression, which means that it might not be as effective because it's storing every single pixel, but it'll still make your file somewhat smaller. Uh, the same thing goes for, for your audio files, right? If you listen to MP3s, Right? Those are making assumptions about how you perceive sound to make this file smaller so that it sounds the same but takes up less space. But you are losing data. And so the, the, the audio files or the purists along, among you might you know, choose to use a FLAC, uh, free lossless audio codec file, or maybe a WAV or WAV file, which doesn't have the same kind of lossy compression. And so this, this type of concept sort of goes all over the place when you think about how uh, images and data are being stored. Generally speaking, when we think about uh, color, uh, this has actually become less and less of an issue these days because most computational services on a journal website, for example, and most printers, 
now have a really good way to handle color. But back in the day, you used to be able to, you used to make this beautiful graphic, you'd print it, and all of a sudden you'd look at it and it's like, why are the greens all washed out? Uh, it turns out that if you're printing something on a page versus displaying something on the screen, the color palette is different. You can't make the bright greens that your screens are currently displaying on a printed page because the inks just aren't capable of it, right? Ink is inherently a subtractive technique. It absorbs light, whereas the, the printed or the screens that we're looking at, it's an additive technique. We're looking at combinations of light that are coming from some kind of lamp or, or you know, an LED um, you know, filter. And so those are, those are different ways of representing color. And because of that, you know, generally speaking, if you're trying to get this very, very nice bright green to show up in your, um, you know, in your image and then you print it out, you're going to be disappointed because this type of bright green is not going to be um, well represented in the, uh, in the, in the, on the page that you printed out at. And this actually applies that, that, you know, humans and, well, all sorts of organisms, but primarily humans, depending on the, the rods and cones that they have, are going to generally perceive color differently for something that's additive on the screen versus subtractive on the page. And so, again, this is not something that we need to talk too much about uh, because most software will now do some of these transformations and make your printout look pretty good. Uh, but in the old days, you had to worry about, you know, is my, um, is my image file stored in a CMYK format, so cyan, magenta, yellow, black, which is more suitable for printed images, or is it stored in RGB format, which is more suitable for uh, projected or displayed images on a screen? So just some best practices here for publication. Uh, generally speaking, every journal that you will publish in will be in a two-column for format. One column is going to be about eight, eight and a half centimeters wide. If your image is longer than that, you're going to be looking at two columns. Uh, and so, you know, think about how you want to display your image. It's not so important on a poster where you have basically all the space that you could possibly want. But if you're publishing in a, in a journal, you want to be able to publish, uh, you know, one column or two columns. Most of the time, one column is preferred. And so that means you have to lay out your data in such a way that you're not taking up two columns. Uh, most journal pages are, are about 28 to 30 centimeters tall. And so if, you know, even though these things aren't really printed anymore, you can't make a 60 centimeter tall image and expect it to get published, at least not without being scaled down considerably. Obviously, posters are going to be bigger, right? If you're, if you're publishing an eight centimeter wide figure at, on a poster, that's going to just make your audience angry because they're going to be trying to look at that thing and, and get the same perception. Remember, when you have a poster, you're going to be standing maybe five, six feet or more away from the poster. And so whatever you see on the poster needs to be clear enough so that when you're standing five or six feet away, your audience isn't trying to squint. And so generally on a poster, you can make your figures bigger but you never want to make them smaller uh, than this. And you want to make sure that they're not trying, that your audience isn't trying to read tiny little details um, from six feet away. 300 dots per inch, uh, inch minimum is what I would recommend for any figure that you want to make. Again, if you go into Photoshop or the GIMP, uh, even some other simple uh, programs like, your, uh, like GraphPad or Origin let you control the dots per inch of your output when you make a TIFF file or a PNG. So just note that and try not to use less than 300 dots per inch. And then again, today most, most journals don't care about color mode. Some of them will, so always be sure to look at those instructions for authors and they'll have a, usually a separate section for the, um, for the uh, uh, image requirements. Fonts, uh, if you're doing a standard journal article, again, this is kind of sort of what's on average acceptable. Some places will let you go as small as four point. I don't think that's helpful. So I would say five point is probably a good minimum to use. Uh, for most labels on a, on a journal image, eight to 10 points fonts would be great. Um, you don't want to get too big because then it looks sort of clunky. 
and you only, you know, if, in, if you have an eight centimeter wide image and all of a sudden your, your font takes up a third of the image, that looks a little bit awkward. So again, these are, these are good recommendations. You know, your mileage may vary. You can always adapt based on what your research advisor says or what you're seeing in articles. Um, and then as far as panel labels, if you have like an A, B, or C, just check the recent articles in that journal and find out what the sort of acceptable standards are. Some will request you to be capital, some will want you to be lowercase, some don't care as long as you're consistent. Uh, but this also brings up the importance is that writing papers well means reading a lot of papers. And so you will be reading papers, but pay attention every once in a while say, hey, how did they lay out this figure? Why did they decide to make this you know, gray versus this black? Or why did they choose this to be a color figure? Lots of people, well, at least I, spend lots of time agonizing over those fine details because I think they make it important. They make a, they make a, a journal publication or a poster more comprehensible if you've thought about them with some intentionality. Okay, uh, if, if you ever want an interesting image uh, or Im image interesting read, uh, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information uh, is a really fun book. It sort of goes through and shows pictures of bad graphs versus good graphs, how you can use um, graphics to, to convey information more effectively. Uh, I used to have a copy of this. I think I lent mine to Todd, Todd Milsna, and so he has, he has it right now. But um, it's, a nice, it's a nice read and sort of shows you how you can really make a graph go from really looking terrible. Uh, and, and they use current, well, not so current examples from like the New York Times and Washington Post, uh, how you can make a graphic being terrible or even misleading back to something that's uh, helpful and informative. Uh, and so and then, then the ultimate thing for this is, is learn what your advisor's preferences are. Uh, I certainly have mine. I believe mine are right. But this is the kind of thing where you, you can get pretty dogmatic for, out, for, uh, for very small nitpicky details. Everybody's going to have their own preferences. And so talk to your research advisor and, and look at publications that have recently come out of your lab. And you'll be able to find out some examples of, of what is quite a, sort of the acceptable software. Software, um, you know, Origin, GraphPad, Grace, MATLAB, all of these work, uh, but most of them cost money, right? So, so we're fortunate we have a, a university license to MATLAB and Mathematica, and so that's actually an acceptable way to make graphics. Uh, but uh, Origin, you know, uh, students have to pay a yearly fee for. It's not terribly expensive, but, but it, it can be prohibitive. It's $100 a year versus $150 a year, I think, for GraphPad. Um, Grace and GNU Plot, you can make publication quality images with those. Grace takes a little bit of, of work. It's a free software that runs on Linux. Uh, and we're not going to, again, go into all the details. Uh, GNU Plot, you guys have the tutorial for. And so we went over that a little bit yesterday. And you know, with some fine tuning, you can also make pretty solid quality figures with GNU Plot uh, as well. One question, though, that students often ask is, can I do this in Excel? Because everybody knows how to use Excel. And that's one of the advantages of this software is that it's, you know, 90% of the time it's installed in your machine. You've probably been using it since middle school uh, or at least since high school. And so you have some familiarity with it. And that's what we're going to explore in the second half of this, uh, this talk. And so for touch up, if, you know, I always, I, well, not often, always, but I often go into um, uh, Illustrator or Photoshop. And like, for example, if a font size on a graph is, is maybe you know, 4.8 points, and I want to just make it a little bit bigger, Illustrator is actually a great way to do that. I wouldn't recommend making that standard practice, um, particularly at, at you know, the undergraduate level, because it's going to be too easy to go in and start manipulating the rest of your graph. Right? And so this brings me to the sort of the final point before we start jumping in and looking at some figures, is you never ever want to use one of these programs to doctor or to manipulate the image in such a way that that might be ethically questionable. Some things are okay, but this is a conversation that you need to have with your advisor. So for example, if you're showing a picture of an SDS page gel, it's often okay to adjust the brightness and contrast 
so that you can sort of bring out, um, you know, so that you're not looking at sort of the, the, this dark gray sort of blur in the background and you can actually see the bands a little bit better. On the other hand, you can also adjust the brightness and contrast to make impurities go away, right? And so those types of discussions need to be had in the context with your research advisor or if you're being supervised by a graduate student. And you need to make, a sure, make sure that you're representing the data you know, accurately. Uh, similarly, in NMR, it's very, very common to use noise reduction or baseline smoothing to make your, your data look as, as pretty as possible. On the other hand, there have been some pretty famous cases out of inorganic chemistry, uh, and you can go and look at some of them at this Retraction Watch website, where people have just gone in and straight up removed peaks uh, from their NMR spectra uh, in a way that was, was thoroughly dishonest. And some people did these more intelligently than others. Uh, as somebody who knows NMR spectroscopy extremely well, I could probably do this without having anybody ever detect it. Uh, but, you know, ethically that would be wrong. And so we don't do things even if we can uh, because they're, they're wrong and misleading. Uh, in one case, though, you could tell that they just basically went in with PowerPoint and drew a little white box over the peaks that they didn't want to see. And that was pretty easy to find. So spending, you know, half an hour, an hour on this website, Retraction Watch, can actually be fun because you get to see how, how silly people are. But on the other hand, keep in mind that that has consequences, right? I mean, if I were to do that as a PI, uh, the NIH could come and say, hey, I don't wanna, I don't, we, we don't wanna fund you anymore. We wanna take away your funding for a few years. And so I tend to take uh, data representation very, very seriously. I think most advisors do, uh, but never take any shortcuts. And if, if you're in doubt, talk to your research advisor and, and they'll, I'm sure, guide you on the right way to go. Okay, so this is kind of what we're going to do for the remainder of our time. We're going to try to make this done because I know I'm right before lunch and we don't have a big long lunch period today. But um, the goal here, this is a paper that I published a long time ago uh, where this was the figure in the journal. So you can see it's a one column figure. It has an inset and in this case it, it uses um, you know, a specific type of labeling, there's some error bars, there's a dotted line, and you might take a look at this and say, well, there's no way you could possibly do that with Excel, right? And I would, I would agree. This, pro this uh, graph we actually used with XM Grace, and then we took Illustrator and did the inset uh, to make the graph look super, super nice. But I will say, and, and in, in my years since, uh, we can approximate this and get pretty darn close to uh, this sort of very polished version using a, a very simple program like Microsoft Excel. It takes some work, and that's what we're going to talk about here, but, but it can be done. And so the issues that Excel has when you make a default graph, you know, one, uh, bad font choice. I mean, for some reason, Excel uses Calibri, although I think that's changing in the next couple of years and it's becoming an even more inappropriate font. Stick with Arial or Times New Roman, you'll, you'll never go wrong. Uh, no labels, so for some reason Excel sort of forgot the idea that you should always label your axes and so default Excel uh, graphs don't have any labels. Uh, their layout is odd. When you do put text in, it's gray. And I've never figured this out, like why? Why not just use black? Uh, but sometimes there's extra chart junk, and that's not my term, that's from that Tufty book, uh, chart junk like grid lines. Uh, they just add ink to the graph, but they don't actually contribute anything useful. Uh, and so there's a lot of stuff that Excel does that we're going to try to try to get rid of. And so, again, I think we have just a couple of extra slides here that will sort of summarize things. but. Let's go in and let's look at Excel. And so those of you who, again, are using Chrome and might have missed this announcement at the first, uh, the first session, if you go on to Chrome, uh, it's not going to let you download Excel files for a security reason. And so I posted a, a post to the Biochemistry Bootcamp website sort of explaining what's going on and why it's not working. Uh, on the other hand, if you use Firefox or Edge, it'll let you download it just fine. And so that's what I recommend. 
Uh, most browsers will have, um, or most computers will have one of those alternatives on. Uh, if not, you'll have to install one really quick. But, um, but it's, it's a security reason. Obviously here it's, you know, I'm not trying to give anybody a virus, so it's not a concern here, but I understand why they did it. But you should be able to go in and download the uh, starting point for this graphic that we're going to try to reproduce. So again, remember our goal is to try to remake this image using Microsoft Excel. And so this is a picture of what we have. Uh, I think I might have, yeah, I wouldn't have done that scaling thing. So this is a picture of, of you know, a screenshot from the, the journal. And this is the data, right? And so to save time, I just you know, made the graphs from Excel and this is basically what you would start with if you created a graph that, that plotted the predicted curve, in this case, which is down here in columns C and D. And then these are the actual experimental data points. And so adding both of those to the, to the graph, um, you can see that there's, uh, you know, it, it's weird. It's orange. It's blue. Again, why those colors? You can't see it so easily, but these are gray. They're not black. And so let's, let's start working. And, and I'm going to kind of move on here at a clip. Again, remember that this will be online, so you'll be able to sort of work through things. And then finally, this slide that we have, it sort of summarizes the kind of things that we're going to do uh, to, to make this look nice. And so the first thing we're going to do is I never use a, ch a, a chart title unless maybe I'm putting one in PowerPoint. So I'll get rid of that. The other thing is if I have this whole graph selected, notice that I can go in and quickly change all the font defaults. So it's Calibri by default. I want that to be Arial. And also I can go in here and change all the font colors back to black. And so that just saved me a ton of space or a ton of time already. Again, I can do the same thing down here. This is going to be our inset graph. And so if I change this to Arial, black, and now I don't have to worry about it. Uh, in this case, I'm going to make our axis labels or our axis, um, yeah, our, yeah the, the axis labels. I'm going to make them uh, 11 points. And so notice here if I change Again, I don't have anything in the graph selected, just the graph itself. If I change that, it's actually going to change both the x and the y axis. And again, that saves time because I don't have to go into one and select it individually or the other and select it individually. So I'll make those 11 points on the top and the bottom. And now again, I'm going to, on this top graph, which is going to be our main graph, I'm going to go back in under format, or I'm sorry, under design, I'm going to add chart element. And here again, axis titles on the x-axis and the y-axis. Notice that these are now aerial, right? So, so by changing the default of the graph, I've made it so that it's, it actually doesn't do it in Calibri anymore. This is easy enough to change. This is going to become absorption capacity. Although I do want to make these both a little bit bigger. So I'll select those and make those maybe 12 points. Can look nice to make them bold. That's fine. And then this one I'm going to do a little bit differently, right? So if I look over here, the model that I'm going for is capital R subscript G with the angstrom. And so how do you do all that in Excel? Well, I can do RG and then I can write an A. That's an approximation. But from within Excel, if I go here into insert symbol, and again, this isn't my normal computer, but angstrom symbol is right here. So I'll insert that. That gives us the angstrom symbol. And then if I select this G and go up here to home, 
font and then click on this little pop out. That lets me put that in subscript, subscript. And so, and for consistency, I'll make this 12 point bold. Okay, so we're getting there. Now we have to go in and start formatting these axes to get it looking like, like there's some tick marks. So to do that, there's no, no easy way. You just have to go in and format each one at a time. Again, you can right click on the axis and hit format axis. That's typically how you would do this. Uh, in this case, this goes from 0 to 30. This is from 0 to 30, so we've already done that. I want to display tick marks. So I go down here. And again, different labs will vary. I like to put my tick marks on the outside, and that way they're not pointing in and, interf and potentially interfering with your data. Different advisors will have different opinions on that, but that's kind of my opinion, where I like to put them on the outside so they're never going to you know, overlap a data point. But your mileage might vary. Again, we'll change our minor tick so that it matches. And here again, this is gray. So we have to go into our axis options. And for our line, solid line is fine. I'm going to change this to a one point line, because often that's the minimum that some publishers will allow you to do. And I'll change that to black. So now we're getting close there. I'll change this to black on the y axis, one point. And here again, I'm going to mess with the axis bounds. So it goes from 0 to 2,000. That's great. But in this graph, the major axis is 500 units, and the minor axis is, or the minor tick is 250. We need to go back in and draw our tick marks. And so again, we're getting closer. The next thing we got to do is this outside border right now is still in gray. So I'm just going to click on the plot area. And I'm going to do a little trick for later. But if I go here, I'm actually going to make this a solid fill. And I'll make it white. We'll see why. That doesn't look like it's going to change anything. And indeed, it really doesn't right now. But our border, I'm going to make that a solid line. Again, one point black line. And now if somebody zooms in, the axis and the border of the graph are going to look consistent. They're all going to be one point in black. If I click the plot area or the chart area, here I'm going to go no fill and no border. And so now what you can see is that this inner area is nicely white and filled. And this outer area is see-through. Now, why did I do that? Well, some of you might have a poster where maybe the background of the poster is a different color than just white. Well, that allows you to have a white background of the plot area, but still allow you to post or color the graph space behind it. It also is great for PowerPoint slides if your background isn't perfectly white. Uh, it makes it a little easier to display. That's obviously not what we did in the paper, but it helps. OK, so now we're going to get rid of the, the, major and the, the major grid lines. We just select those and we hit Delete. And now I'm just going to rush through quickly, and it will be kind of a rush. Uh, and do this similar thing down here, right? So once you get comfortable with this, it actually doesn't become that time consuming. And if I can do it while presenting, you guys should be able to do it while, uh, while watching me present. Notice actually these don't, this inset does not have access titles, so I'm going to delete those. But I will have to do the other stuff.
To my knowledge, in Excel, there's no way to put tick marks on both sides of the graph. So that is one limitation. We'll get to see here at the end how, how it sort of looks and what the approximations are. And that one goes from 0 to 250. And so here again, I'll adjust the graph fill and the border around it. And I'll delete my grid lines. OK. Oh. And notice here it looked, you know, when I put my major axis, it, it does this weird thing. So this is another thing that Excel kind of limits you. You don't have quite the same flexibility. But this is pretty good. OK, so now I have two different graphs. One's going to be my inset. One's going to be my main graph. And I can actually start getting them laid out, right? Now notice here there's a border. So I forgot to flip that, so no line. And so that's actually a pretty reasonable approximation. Now how do I get my data points to look like they should, right? Because here I have you know, orange and blue. And so the easiest way is, again, just to format that data series. This is probably something that you guys are much more uh, comfortable with. But I'm going to do solid line. And in this case, I'll do a, a dash type of just the dots. Notice that there's a button here for smooth line. Never check that. That should never be checked. And I'll, I'll show you why here in a second. But we always want this to be unchecked. And since for this is the, the line and not the, the points, we're going to go in here and we'll hit uh, no marker. And now we can go in and do the same thing for our data points. In this case, they're triangles pointing up. And you can tell that there's error bars. So we'll add the error bars too. So for this one, it's marker. And we want it to be black. Oops, not gray. And we'll use the triangle pointing up. Maybe make it a little bit bigger. So solid fill. It doesn't really need a border, so we'll just do no line. And now if you look at that, that actually is pretty reasonable. Now let's just, for an example, go in here and I'm going to turn a line on. So we'll do solid line. And so again, notice that smooth line is turned off, so it's drawing the jagged edges. If I click smooth line, it appears to be correct. But if you, if you look in, if you zoom in, you'll actually see systems where like there's a slope here that sort of starts out and then goes and, and sort of tails down. This can be actually much more pronounced in some graphs where you'll actually see the smooth line actually will dip below one point and then come back up. That's one of the reasons you don't want smooth line turned on, because it's making approximations to your data that you don't really have, to, you don't have the justification for. If you're drawing a line through your data based on some model, go for it. But a smooth line is basically just saying, oh, I want to draw something that's nice and smooth through these points. And so that's rarely the, the, rarely the situation you find yourself in. 
So again, as a general rule, just don't use the smooth line. And in this case, we're not going to use a line at all. Okay, how do I add error bars? Again, I can go here to add chart element, error bars. It doesn't really matter, we're going to delete them. So we'll delete the horizontal error bars. And then we'll go back and select the error bars and we'll draw them from the data. And so again, here, if I go down here and do custom error bars, I can specify the value. And so I'll draw a positive value for the uncertainty and negative value for the uncertainty. I'll hit OK. And once again, I'll go in. This is still gray, but I'll make them one point. And so now I've drawn in the error bars. And I can do the same thing for here. I'll format my data series again. And notice it's doing data points. So I'll just go in here. And I can drag down from the format menu. And I think this is series one. Marker. Let's make it black. Let's make it a triangle. Let's remove the border. And once again, we'll go in and we'll add error bars. So add chart element, error bars. We'll delete the horizontal ones. And we'll select the vertical ones and we'll go in and customize them. So we click this little graph button again, custom. It's the same exact values. And so there's pretty much a, a reasonable approximation. Now let's, let's, we can re resize this. Again, if I hold down Control, or I'm, I'm sorry, if I hold down Alt, it'll actually let me resize this so that it sticks to the cell boundaries. I can make this look roughly square. I can make this bigger. And so there's the, there's the comparison, right? Now I can, I can look at this and I can nitpick and find differences, but this actually is pretty reasonable. And I would say on a poster or even a publication, this would be a pretty acceptable way to make a, a publication quality figure. Um, there's some limitations in, in you know, the, the axis boundaries and, and whether you could make these fancy, you know, two or three width error bars where I've skipped 50s and I've drawn like long, short, long, short, long. Uh, so there's some things that I can't do very easily in Excel. But once again, you could take this, you could copy and paste it into a poster or into a PowerPoint file. It will look perfectly good if you draw a background on it. And so it's not going to have, uh, you're not going to have sort of white boundaries or borders on it. The other interesting thing is if I wanted to make a two-part figure, like maybe a two-panel figure, I could do A. And I'm just typing into the Excel at this point. And then I could copy this figure and paste it down below. And I can use, again, those... Um, holding down control, and here sometimes to type behind the graph you have to sort of use your arrow keys, 
I can go in and hit B, make it bold, make it big. And now I have a two panel figure with, that are, that's labeled A and B. And so you can use the grid of Excel your, itself to figure out where the panels should be. Some other things that you can do, again, are just highlighted here on the tips. You know, so if I wanted to control what was made on the PDF here, I could select this, make this my print area, and now if I want to print this as a PDF, or I guess just save it as a PDF, And so now you can see it's laid out as a PDF. It's pretty much huge. I can zoom in as much as I possibly would want to, and it's not going to be pixelated. And you could use that as your example. And so, so Excel might not be the best option. It might not be the first option that your lab goes to. You certainly have to fight it to get good graphics out of it. But you can get reasonable graphics out of Excel without spending hundreds of dollars on these other software. And as an undergrad particularly, I would say this is probably the way you should go. You don't need to go buy, you know, unless your advisor is going to buy it for you or has a lab license or something, you don't need to go buy, you know, GraphPad or, or Origin. You can probably get by with Excel if you're willing to take the time to fight with it and get the, get the images looking nice.